Hello, and welcome to Earshot. My name is Logan Barrett. I am your host this episode for Earshot, and I am here with composer Anya Vu, and I will be interviewing her about her work a uh, pianist and composer of Polish and Vietnamese descent, Anya Vu, writes music that explores the interplay between the sound properties and meanings of words, musical energy related to form, and varied notations of time. She is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania and a composer fellow at the American Opera Project's two-year program, Composers and the Voice. In 2017, she received her BM in composition and theory from the Eastman School of Music. Welcome, Anya. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I met Anya at a festival called Soundscape. I believe 2018 was the year. Yes, that's right. I think she had just started her program at UPenn. Yeah. And I was still in my undergraduate program. Um, we were supposed to meet again in Tampa, Florida, um, at the University of South Florida. Um, but that was happening right as the pandemic started and I think you know like three weeks before I think yeah I remember now it was gonna happen yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. it feels so long ago I know I totally forgot about that uh but yeah I was supposed to I already had my flight booked uh and I think uh mm -hmm. I even like asked if I could stay with you I think because you were the only person that I knew who also got selected for the festival uh yeah I was from the Tampa area and we were gonna I think stay together at my parents' house. <laughs> we had to cut it short. So um, we're going to talk a lot about your work, and we know that you have a piece um, that you wrote with Camp. You wrote it for Unmi Ko and Bob McCormick, right? Yes, that's correct. So I think we'll we'll just start a little bit about your, yourself first. So um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you came into music and composition? Sure. So I was born into a family uh, where my mom was already a musician. She uh, is a composer and pianist, and she studied composition in Moscow. Um, so she was a formally trained uh, musician. Uh, my dad was a big music lover, um, and he would be collecting tapes and listening to music just anywhere uh, he uh, he, he could in a car or in you know his room when he was not working. Um, so I was always kind of surrounded by music. Um, and when I was a, like a kid, four or five years old, my parents would take me to uh, the National Philharmonic, uh, you know, to listen to a lot of classical music. And that's where I met my first piano teacher. Uh, and I began my piano lessons when I was like five and a half. Um, and then at the age of seven, I officially enrolled into a public music school and I stayed there for, you know, until the end of high school. Yeah. And when did you start writing stuff down and composing? Well, um, as a young teenager, I was really into film music at the time and my dream was to become a film composer. Um, and I wrote my very first piece when I was 15, um, a piece for so, uh, saxophone, soprano, and piano, and uh, it had some elements of jazz. You know, I mean, I I just I just wrote this piece without any 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 lessons, any training, and I just uh, wrote it down for fun um, because there was this uh, school contest uh, at my music school, and so I submitted the piece, um, and then. I don't know, a few weeks later, my friend texted me that, uh, hey, your piece has won the first prize. So <laughs> that oh, was, wow. uh, yeah, a, a nice surprise. But uh, yeah, I, um, I, I guess then I had a, a small gap and I started uh, writing again, I think at the age of 18, 19, right before I was applying um, for, for my undergraduate degree. And so... Maybe I, I think some people have a um, hard time understanding the disconnect between like playing an instrument and then like composing because like people come to it for different reasons mm -hmm. and it's like oh like how do you just do that <laughs> so I mean maybe like um, 
I guess as you were entering like your undergraduate program at like, you know, 18, 19, um, like how important was piano and like um, how important was composing and how did those relate to each other? Like, what did it mean to you then? Yeah. Oh, that's a, those are all very, very good questions. Well, I grew up playing uh, the piano and being a very, very classically trained. Um, and I think that there, there was this mindset that we were learning pieces uh, to the point of quote unquote perfection um, and, you know, not really um, experimenting too much, but just like, you know, kind of learning and evolving with the pieces uh, over a long period of time, which on one hand is good because you get to really learn uh, the repertoire, the canon at uh, great depth. But on the other hand, you know, I really uh, didn't learn any improvisation or uh, what mm-hmm. they call contemporary music was really just up until learning Bartok or Prokofiev. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, so a uh, very different world. And then when I came to Eastman, I was suddenly exposed to so much uh, new music, uh, which uh, was really uh, mind and eye ear opening for me. Um, I think when once I got to Eastman, um, I also started enjoying <laughs> playing the piano more in a weird way because piano was suddenly not no longer my major, and I felt like I could finally be actually mm-hmm. creative and not be so focused on on the uh, you know, technique. I was actually considering for some time um, during a master's in piano performance Mm -hmm. after Eastman. Uh, But then I think composition won and I realized that it, you know, with composition you can, you have like really unlimited freedom, uh, which can be very uh, empowering, but also scary at the same time. Yeah, a lot of composers have very different relationships to the instrument they play um like i i play the piano but i could never i can perform in large groups but i couldn't like do a solo recital or anything like that um and you know half half the composers you meet will be able to play half won't and yeah it's an interesting um segue that brings us into composing well anyway why don't we start talking about some of your a little bit more about what you do compositionally um I think, I mean, certainly something interesting about you is is you're a musician that has a lot of um, different kinds of influences going on. Like, like you just mentioned that you were classically trained, um, but you also are, are a multicultural composer. You have, you're Vietnamese, Polish. You have both of those traditions in there somewhere. Um, you have classical training you've done electronic music and you know contemporary music like you just mentioned at the end there yeah um and it's it's common of a lot of composers um and it's definitely unique in your case so i think what i was wondering about is just as a person that writes music and has to you know give these pieces to people like taking all these aspects of your identity um how have you found that you've um, crafted maybe one identity for yourself and what is, how does that change over time? Yeah. Excellent question. So I think because of my uh, piano background, uh, my first few compositions were very much centered around like uh, the contemporary language of the early 20th century uh, music. Um, I was still kind of writing in that uh I guess we can say style while well, I was at Eastman. And I think uh, after I came to Penn, I have started to write music that was more in response to, I don't know, my own experiences or my own actual interests. And not just, you know, writing music that I was uh, just learning from from school and, and, you know, kind of given things to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the past few years, I have, uh, kind of developed two uh, interests. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, playing with time. Like, I'm really fascinated with time in music, like how it can really manipulate the listener's perception, either by uh, making time seem to flow, um, flow slower or faster than the time outside of uh, music. Mm-hmm. 
And then another thread that I think is even like more prominent now in my work is working with language and text. So growing up, uh, I have always really enjoyed uh, the language uh, subjects in school. Like there were always, uh, you know, things that I was looking forward to the most uh, during my time in school. And so, you know, I grew up speaking Vietnamese with my family and then Polish because I lived in Poland, French because I was put in a French school. And then in that school, I had to learn, of course, English, um, German. I mean, my German is not great. <laughs> I, I studied five years of it, but uh, I have forgotten a lot of it. And then, you know, three years of Latin, which is, again, a dead language, but it also was very uh good to learn because you know you would understand a lot of like roots from other languages mm -hmm. so anyway um i think at soundscape actually uh when i was uh commissioned to write this song for uh mezzo soprano percussion and piano uh, that's when i actually f uh discovered that uh, i enjoyed learning that sorry i enjoyed writing text uh because uh for that uh uh, I guess commission. I uh, I wrote the text myself, and then since then I've been doing that um, since. Yeah, I remember that piece. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and that poem. Uh, so so you 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 know the song. Um, the same poem then later on ended up you know being uh, like influencing a piece for a string quartet. Um, mm -hmm. I yearn therefore I am. That was uh, premiered by the Daedalus Quartet. Yeah, and we'll be listening to that piece in just a few minutes. Um, I mean, yeah, especially your relationship to language, I, I think, is a huge, important part of your work. Um, you know, w composers and like like working with text and language in general has, you know, an, an unusual history. Like, you know, we could go through the, all of the history of music to talk about that. Um, but, you know, one weird thing is that when we're setting text, the composer will go to some poet. It usually, you know, there's copyright issues, so you might have to go before 1922 exactly. and work yeah. with them. And we, you know, take this text and present it in a piece. And it's just this sort of unique, like totally different part of composing. Yeah. Um, that we approach really differently from how we approach just music with instruments. Um and the good thing about writing your own text is it, it's modern and <laughs> there's no cop there's no copyright exactly um, and you can also you can you can change your own text to fit the music as well which is something weird yeah <laughs> sometimes would love to do yeah yeah exactly and those works my uh, my reasons one of the reasons why I chose to uh, take the risk and, and and try to write words myself because it does give you so much more freedom and uh, you know, you don't run the risk of uh, upsetting the the poet or, um, you know, having copyright issues, as you mentioned. So I think you have so much more agency when you are both like the composer and, you know, poet, I guess, or text writer. Yeah. So this poem that you wrote, um, it's in Polish, right? And it's yes. based off of sort of linguistic puns. Yes, yes. Um so it, I, I, I chose specific sounds that I wanted to play with um, and then how some of these sounds could be spelled differently. Um, and my goal was to uh, still write, you know, and create a narrative that made sense, not just like some random words put together. So it already felt like, you know, a game that I had, uh, you set up the rules. The rules are, uh, you know, create a, a sensical narrative uh, that is meaningful to you in a personal way. And then also play with uh, the sounds of these words. Um, and uh, of course, like uh, form, as, as composers, we're always concerned about form. And uh, I think I, I actually don't think of myself as like a poet, but more like a text composer, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there, I guess that spurns a lot of questions. Um, well, for one thing, I, I guess speaking, I guess, six different languages. Um, well, fluently like, four. I wouldn't say that I'm fluent in all of yeah. those. <laughs> fluently speaking four different languages. Um, how does, like, how has learn, how has, um, learning different languages affect how you approach one? Um, 
Is that, do you think that led you more to focus on just the sound? Um, do you think that led you to doing it with music, that kind of thing? Well, to be honest, initially, when I was working on that poem, I was thinking of uh, writing a multi-language uh, poem that uses uh, similar sounds. I was thinking of uh, actually French and Polish. And then uh, at the time, somehow, like later on, I, I thought, you know, this is maybe too much at this stage. I might experiment with that later. And I still want to do it um, somewhere uh, in the future. But uh I think at the time, because it was my first poem, I just wanted to stick to one language. And uh, after that poem, I wrote uh, two more poems in Polish uh, that I set to text to, um, sorry, I set to music. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like Polish is such a fun language to, to do these kinds of things because words are pretty long. So you can kind of uh, maybe decompose some of these words by chopping of like uh, the last syllable, for example, and the word might still make sense. And also the sounds, I think, are very cool. Like the, the vowels are very straight um, and direct. And, uh, and it also has a lot of consonants, uh, of course, which is why I thought would be fitting for the, uh, the instrumentation that also included percussion. Cool. Well, so why don't we start talking a little bit more about this um string quartet it's called i yearn therefore i am mm -hmm. um and this is a totally instrumental piece it doesn't have actual text um, recited in it um so like what's the deal with that like how do you <laughs> translate language into a string quartet yeah so um actually the poem i have divided it into four different parts and then um, those parts, each of those four parts ended up being a separate movement in the piece. Um, and the first uh, part of the poem is just, you know, uh, building up from one syllable uh, to adding another syllable uh, at the end of, of the line. And, you know, you go from one syllable to, I don't know, a phrase of like eight or nine syllables that kind of are playing with homophonic sounds mm. and so uh, I kind of almost literally translated this form into the music um, and each um, section uh, short section corresponds to like a syllable um, that centers around a certain pitch and so uh, subsequently as we get uh, longer and longer lines um of words then the each of those these sections become shorter in the music uh, so that's like one way of of, of uh, using the text um, I also in the second movement I think that's like the part in the poem where there are lots of uh, um, it's it's almost like a tongue twister uh, lots of zh, sh, zh sounds Mm -hmm. some, and the text also talks about the storm and the the sea and so it's quite fitting like the way both the meaning and the sounds uh, are conveying this kind of uh, you know stormy turbulent uh, character um, and uh, in the music it's reflected with maybe like some uh, delicate um, overpressure um, and uh, you know th things like that and uh, the <sighs> Okay, I'm skipping over the third uh, movement, but the fourth movement, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting <laughs> everything that I did. But in the fourth movement, I know that um, it's like a very... So, so what we did in the first part where, you know, there's addition, uh, adding syllables consequently one after the other. In the last movement, it's uh, decomposing. So we're subtracting the syllables. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, it's uh, about like uh, yearning. Uh, and the word stansknote, which means from yearning, mm -hmm. then becomes decomposed into just d at the end, which means you. Uh, so it's like a mm. very kind of, to me, lyrical uh, ending. And so this character, this lyricism is translated into the character of the music. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you can do such an abstract process on words and it can totally change the meaning or take on something totally different um yeah i think as musicians we're used to working abstractly because music is um it's so abstract maybe compared to just poetry because poetry 
you know, most of the time like refers to something or we're used to, we're, we're so used to seeing words all the time that, mm-hmm. and they're always referring to something else that we're used to that. Yeah. Um, maybe something I'm curious about is like, just how do you find those connections, like changing yearn to you? Like, is, is it just an accident? Do you have to like chug at it for a while? Like, where does that come from? Well, I mean, I was just really playing around with text. I didn't even know that I could uh, mm. do these playful things uh, with words like mm-hmm. chopping them and and that there would be another word. Uh, and that's something that I'd actually discovered while uh, working on that poem. You know, I'm sure there will be more uh, discoveries to, to be found uh, if I were to spend more time and like, uh, you know, maybe... I don't know, change the, the order of the syllables and maybe I, I would get another word. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, there, there must be so many, so many uh, things. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm also uh, interested in maybe playing with uh, other languages. Um, I think Vietnamese would be super interesting to work with um, in the future. Because it also has uh, seven different tones. Uh, So if it were to be sung, um, there's limits to what you can do. I mean, you cannot just put uh, a vowel that's low, you know, to a high note, for example. So uh, the, the tones of the of the language would also dictate kind of the contour of the melody. Yeah, I think we we could, we should go ahead and um, take a moment to listen to it. Now we're gonna um, play the string quartet called "I Yearn, Therefore I Am." It is performed by the Daedalus Quartet in uh, twenty nineteen, I believe. Yep. And where was it performed exactly? Um, it was performed uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so let's take a listen to Anya Vu's I Year and Therefore I Am for a String Quartet.
That was I Yearn, Therefore I Am for a string quartet by composer Anya Vu. So it, it's a great piece. It, it It's um, maybe on the first... I, I've listened to it quite a few times now, and um, I think having the context of knowing that it's about language really changes what it means. Um, in the program notes, you mentioned that it influences what sounds you use at multiple levels, like just at the individual level of pitches and rhythms, yeah. and then sort of section lengths, and then like the entire piece. Um, exactly. So maybe just on a global, at a global level, like how were you thinking about the relationship between language and instrument music? Um, the overall form, I would say, but also the overall feeling, the emotional feeling that we get from reading the poem. Mm -hmm. um, I care about that a lot uh, because in the end, you know, I, I mean, although I enjoy uh, doing things uh, like, like following uh, some things mechanically, you know, like, oh, here I'm going to add another section because, you know, I'm following the text. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, the piece of music or, or the poem also needs to uh, have something more uh, to it than just like following some rules um, mm -hmm. or some principles. So, uh, yeah, I would say uh, the carrying the emotional feeling of, of the text. Yeah, and you mentioned at the end of your program notes, you say that although one can read the poem to enhance the listening experience of the music, both the poem and the music can exist as standalone works. So we're, we're, we're quickly running out of time here. So I, I think we're going to um, talk about your piece for the upcoming camp concert. It's on October 3rd, right? And this is a piece for Bob McCormick and Unmi Ko. It's for piano and percussion. So the piece is entitled uh, Two Plus. Um, so when I started writing the piece, I had like several different sketches. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I always work so much with pitch. Uh, like as a composer, I'm uh, I'm very drawn to working with uh, you know crafting like the most perfect melody or you know something that always has to do with pitch and less with rhythm. And so I gave a challenge to myself to play with only two pitches, uh, E sharp and F sharp. I mean, don't worry, the whole piece uh, <laughs> doesn't only do that the whole time, <laughs> but it is like kind of um, a big part of the piece. Um, and uh, paradoxically, this big constraint did push me to be more creative with other aspects of, of, um, of music, such as uh, texture, uh, rhythm, articulation, dynamics, um, and form, of course. And I think the most interesting uh, thing was form because, you know, the big question was, do I just keep <laughs> playing with these two pitches or do I also... Uh, introduce something different like how different um and at what point in the piece um so those were like fun things to think about during the writing process and you know of course it, it kept changing but uh, i think the way it is now i hope it will work i mean i think it works personally but again i would have to hear it uh, actually what it sounds like you know other than just on my midi <laughs> Um, right. but, uh, and we will very soon. Yeah. Um, I can't wait. Yeah. So, um, how did you, um, end up making the connection with, um, Bob and me? Like how did that, how did the commission itself come about? Um, to be honest, uh, kind of out of the blue maybe because, uh, Unmi just, uh, messaged me or maybe I think I gave a presentation at, um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at this fest what was supposed to be the festival um, yep. that got cancelled. And so you, uh, and me uh, asked me if I wanted to give a presentation. So after my presentation, I think maybe a week or two later, she texted me on Messenger and she was like, hey, do you know, write a piece for me and Bob. <laughs> and I was like, sure. So uh, it just happened like that, really. Uh, and yeah, working with them has been really great uh they're both very responsive to emails uh which is really helpful and they're they ask a lot of questions and you know are super positive and open to 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 anything that i suggest so it's been a very uh smooth uh collaboration so far um 
and I'm waiting for the recorded rehearsal uh, from them. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I really I'm I'm eager to <laughs> to hear what uh, what the, what it sounds like. Yeah, the concert um, it's in Orlando and it's um, Sunday, October third, twenty twenty one at seven p.m. in the Tamuka Arts White House, which is a um, a well known arts venue in Orlando. Cool. So I think um, we have a little bit of time left. Maybe we could talk a little bit about what you're working on now and um, what the future is holding for your work. Sure. Well, um, currently I am working on an opera for a chamber ensemble, multimedia and mm -hmm. electronics. Um, and uh, it's called Through the Doors. The instrumentation is for Piero Ensemble plus percussion, uh, soprano and baritone. So eight people in total. Um, and uh, it's quite of a unusual uh, project for me because it's like a pretty large scale uh, project um, for me. <laughs> I haven't worked on uh, on something that has uh, that also involves you know uh, multimedia um, and you know so many uh, so many musicians and. Uh, also to be working with an actual narrative like a like a story so uh i've been collaborating with a visual artist and, and friend modesta gorol uh, she's polish uh and uh, she will be the one designing the background visuals and uh short animations for the for the piece and uh i'll be writing the music obviously and uh, we wrote the story from we wrote a story from scratch together based on like you know both of our interests like what she's interested in visually and what I'm interested in uh musically and uh also we have very similar interests I think in in you know literary topics in general I think um and so yeah it's been so such a rewarding experience to be working with somebody who's so like-minded as you are but who's in a different field so I have been really enjoying this collaboration so far yeah, and where will it be, where will it be put on? Um, so it's still a big question. Um, mm -hmm. Either you know it will be a live performance in Philadelphia, or it will be just recorded and um, you know distributed later online. I I don't know. I still have to decide on that. But uh, either way, it will be recorded uh, or performed in Philadelphia, um, which is where I'm based right now. Well, that's that's super exciting, and, and opera is like a it's a huge deal to, you know, yeah. take such an ambitious project and make that work. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm a little terrified, uh, but uh, <laughs> I haven't started writing the music yet, actually. But uh, yeah, I'll be diving into that very soon. Yeah, well, well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I guess to round out the podcast, um, we. I should mention that CAMP is now accepting submissions from both composers and performers for their inaugural music festival, um, CAMP Ground 2022. If you go to their website at contemporaryartmusicproject.org, you will be able to find the submission portals and the deadline is fast approaching. So we encourage anyone who's interested, composer or performer to apply. And, and I, th I think that about does it. Um, Thanks for joining us, Anya. It was yeah. great to learn a little bit more about your work. Thank you, Logan, for uh, this uh, conversation. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah, and, th and thank you for taking the time. Um, next time, uh, Tucker will be hosting, and I, be I believe we it will be an interview with composer David Luptak, who is also someone both Anya and I know. Yes. <laughs> so, All right, thanks so much, Anya. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.